Okay, so um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, it's John Richardson speaking here, and I have Andrew and Claire Bowen uh, on the other end of this webinar. I have the have the audio at the moment, but I'll be passing through to them in a minute. Uh, we're just coming up to the top of the hour, the time to get started. Um, so just give it another few seconds while we wait and see uh, who else we've got coming on. And then we will get going. You can see the title there, which I'll go through in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, okay, look, let's, uh, let's just get going. Um, so uh, today what we're going to talk about is how to open a profitable coffee shop while producing something unique that can beat the chains and not spending a fortune on the wrong thing. So the key thing is here, we're going to go through the, 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 main, the main things that you really, really need to focus on in terms of producing and opening a profitable coffee shop and not make the mistakes that I have made or that Andrew and Claire have made and that many, many, many of the uh, of the people that we know in the industry have also made. So, you are in the right place if perhaps you've been dreaming of opening a coffee shop but still have lots of unanswered questions or maybe you're too, you're close to opening and need some final clarity and some key points. Or maybe you've just opened and are looking for further advice. So it doesn't really matter where you are in the process, I can pretty much guarantee you that we've got something to help you today. So here's what you will learn by hanging around. You're gonna learn this very specific seven step process that you must have in place to create a, seven, a successful coffee shop. Uh, you're going to learn Andrew's uh, 73 point process to almost guarantee you get the location right. I only discovered this uh, about a year ago from Andrew and it, it's one of the cleverest things I have, I have seen in my 25 years in the industry. Really, really important. Uh, you're also going to learn the correct way to design a profitable menu with some very specific targets. Uh, for each part of the day. You're going to understand the, the finances. Boring as that may be, we're going to show you how much you need to spend or give you a reasonable approximation on how much profit you might expect to make. So, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Andrew and Claire. I'll do it myself rather than um, go through the, the hassle of swapping over the microphones. I've known Andrew and Claire for quite a long time. Uh, they gave up a conventional corporate world, the very conventional sort of big business corporate world to buy a coffee public franchise. We'll go into the more details of how, as to how well or not that went in a minute. They have built their own small chain of coffee shops with their own brand. Uh, and they continue to own a very successful coffee shop without the need to be there. They are also the authors of the Daily Grind book, uh, an excellent book, uh, and the highly acclaimed Cafe Success Hub. So they provide consultancy and they work with lots of independent coffee shops in the same way that I do. Uh, there's a copy of their book, which is uh, has a forward by me. Uh, John Richardson, if you don't know who I am, I have a, it's always slightly embarrassing when you have to go through your story in this piece, but I've built and sold 13 different hospitality businesses, including several coffee shops. So I kind of, I know this market very, very well. I've also now spent 18 years as a consultant to the coffee shop industry with hundreds of clients in multiple countries. Uh, I've helped build and sell the most profitable small chain of coffee shops in the UK, which happened about four years ago. I created from scratch 27 profitable coffee shops for the National Health Service. Uh, I'm the author of three best-selling books on setting up and running coffee shops, and here are my three books. First book was really a book of tips in terms of profitability. Second book was much more of a step-by-step -step guide to setting up your own coffee shop. And the final book is, um, 22 interviews and in-depth um, analysis of 22 of the best coffee shops in the world. So make sure you stay right until the end because we're going to show you how you can receive, well, first of all, all of these slides which you can then put together and use in terms of your own planning. We're also going to give you Andrew's full location process, which as I say is is a touch of genius in my mind. It's a really, really clever piece of work. And I'm going to give you that full process, but you've got to stay to the end and we'll tell you how you can get it then. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit more of the detail. This is me, what is this, 19, 1991, at university with my business studies degree. And uh, that was, in theory, the right thing to do if you wanted to go into business, but it was perhaps just a really good way. That's as a face of naivety is probably what I should say. Uh, a face that, that, that really didn't know how difficult it was to run, run a business. So I arrived back to Northern Ireland in 1992 with my business studies degree, uh, and that unfortunately, uh, actually it still makes me quite sad to look at some of those things, that is that unfortunately 
uh, the state of Northern Ireland, that's an exaggerated state, but these were these were bombs, these were incidents that happened in 1992 in Northern Ireland. Uh, so it was still a very difficult place. It was a very difficult place to operate as an entrepreneur. It was a very difficult place to operate in many sort of conventional jobs. Uh, but I went into business with a very good friend of mine and we set up a sandwich bar. Now, Within a very short period of time, we did a lot of stuff very well. We grew very quickly, and then we made some massive errors. We kind of humiliatingly lost the whole thing. At the age of 28, I had the biggest sandwich business in Ireland. At the age of 29, I had lost it all, which, I mean, at 29, it's very easy to bounce back, but it's still kind of humiliating. There's no doubt about it. So what went wrong? Well, there were some key factors. We made some partnership choices, which is a very common thing. We did some overly enthusiastic opportunity grabbing, which I would regard as sort of jumping at opportunities. Very, very common that in an entrepreneurial way where people think, yeah, let's do this. Let's try that. It'll be fun rather than really... Uh, you know, um, thinking out and having a strategy. We had very poor cash flow management and just kept spending every penny we had in terms of growing the business. Not every penny we had in terms of lavish cars and, and houses and things. We just grew, but we didn't keep any reserves at all. And we had very poor financial reporting. So there were some very big lessons there. And I became then obsessed with trying to see what we had done wrong, what had we done right, and trying to apply much more of those business principles that I had learned at university with an awful lot of other help from other people then too. So this, this obsession became trying to find out, is there a formula for running a profitable hospitality business, a food and beverage business? That has been effectively the 20 years obsession of my life. And through that, I've had a chain of fish and chips subsequently, which uh, won multiple awards. I've had a pizza restaurant, I've had multiple full service, very, very busy coffee shops uh, in my own name. Um, I've had a bar, uh, I've had a garden centre chain. So out of that, I got most of the solutions in my mind and most of the formula. Um, but then wanted to go out and start doing lots more consultancy through um, with, with other clients to make sure that really what I'd learnt wasn't just my own information, that it could really be applied across the board. So I wrote those three books. I started consultancy, as I say, nearly 20 years ago for purely for coffee shops, really a little bit of restaurant work, but purely for coffee shops. Uh, I set up the Coffee Boys with uh, Hugo Martin, who I've still have done a lot of work with over the years, and much more on the coffee side he is. Um, I've had nearly 100 one-on-one -on -one clients. I've had over a 1,000 clients online, all in the coffee shop industry, and these three internationally best-selling books. Um, I've also, in the last four or five years, picked up some very, very clever mentors, stroke joint uh, venture partners, people who have been um, much more successful than me. I have a very good friend that sold a restaurant business for $51 million. Um, and I do a lot of work with him in various ways. And, and, and I've managed to flesh out the information, not just from the consultancy, not just from my own um, businesses, but also some much larger businesses, as I say. Uh, and, and, and I'm working, continue to work with some people who have sold their businesses for tens of millions. I've, become, I've been the go-to expert on business for cafe culture for over 10 years uh, now, and I'm working very closely with them in terms of the rejuvenated version of cafe culture that will be out next year. Um, I've been speaking and paid to speak on coffee shops all over the world. Um, and I've done these interviews in the most recent book with the very, very, very best that exists. Andrew and Claire come from a slightly different angle. Um, I've done this with a slightly patronising slide because Claire came through as a midwife. So hence the, you know, the, the call the midwife slide. Obviously, that was not what it looked like. But she came through from that world, a very different world to the coffee shop world. And Andrew had a had a had a very big job in Tesco's. Um, but he, you know, the 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 big job in Tesco's or the big job in the corporate world may sound sometimes very good in terms of the salary and the benefits and 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 you know all, all of that all of the status that goes with that the company cars and and maybe the maybe also the um the, the stability that it creates, but it was actually not a lot of fun for them. Something really wasn't working for their for, in, in their lives. There were huge hours for Andrew, uh, and then huge frustration for Claire within the NHS, and I've done a lot of work within the NHS, so I understand that. So they, they, they felt like they wanted to break free. They felt like they wanted to get out of this, um, this difficult world of the corporate world and go and open a coffee shop, so they thought the solution was to open a Coffee Republic franchise, because, of course, at that stage, Coffee Republic was doing very well. But perhaps not. They had three great years of rapid expansion. Then they discovered really that the support in many key issues was very, very limited. 
and that hospitality was very different from retail. So Andrew was has applied a lot of the good techniques from retail, which he'll come to. But also there's a, there are some fundamental differences. They ended up at one stage off the back of some mismanagement from the Coffee Republic side of things with a £75,000 electricity bill. Now, they did manage to get that mostly re resolved. But to me, it's one of the best examples of the very common horror mistakes that sometimes happen when you go out there, not just with franchises, but with all sorts of landlords or different kinds of setups. So then Coffee Republic went bust. And really, the learning then properly started. So what they had to do was completely rework the model, build in new systems, their own systems that really worked, radically tighten up the people processes, uh, extensive menu reworking, and rebuild a whole new business in their own in their own right, using their own expertise and their own skills. And it went very well. They successfully then built that business and sold off two of the sites. They continue to have one very busy, very profitable and highly systemized site, which can be run in a very much a hands off fashion so that they can deal with their clients. They have the best selling daily book, the daily book, the daily grind, how to open and run a coffee shop that actually makes money. And they have a passion for helping clients not make the same mistakes, um, which is where we both come together. So we promised you to give you these sort of initial, or what are these seven steps? What are the seven steps that you need to have in place? I've been playing around with this as a formula for approximately a decade now. It has refined a lot over the years. Um, it refined even more so in the last book, and it's refined a lot then, you know, from having worked with Andrew and Claire over the last year or so. And discovering that actually what they have is effectively the same steps, but just by a slightly different name. So what we start off with is kind of the why or the passion that I've always talked about. Then what is the product? You've got to have this great, you've got to have real clarity over the why of your do, what you're doing. A real passion for producing something really great. You've got to then produce an innovative and great product. You've got to have great positioning, a great location. You've got to be serving the right food and beverages through to the right people. You've got to have great people. Hospitality is built on people. You've got to have great systems and you've got to have consistency applied through to the customer because that's how you can defeat the chains because the chains are what consistency is one of the reasons as to why people go to the chains if you can have great products and consistently deliver them you start to really give yourself an advantage marketing is essential for all businesses you have to become the local hero, as Andrew and Claire would talk about. And you've got to know the numbers. You've got to have your, your financial side of the business set up from when you start. And you've got to have it set up the whole way through so that you can to manage it as a business. So that all looks quite simple. It all looks as if it's, you know, there's a clear step process. But, but if I can just demonstrate to you now how much depth there is in each one of these. So we've got our seven steps. And if we choose number four, uh, the people part of it, four people breaks down into three different categories at its broadest, and they are recruitment, induction, and retention. Now, you could run a two or three day seminar on each one of those. Uh, I have a produced induction, which is multi-day induction for some very, uh, you know, for, for the NHS and for some smaller chains as well. Uh, these are huge subjects in their own right. So if I just to go down the induction rule, there are basically seven critical rules within that alone. One of the documents that I wrote was an 11,500 word document for the trainer to show them how to actually deliver the day. So you can see how there are endless individual pieces within each part of it. So what we try to do and what we're going to do today is go through some, we can't go through all seven steps. We want to show you some of the really critical stuff and what that is today is we're going to show you some information on the product side of things and on profitable menu design. This is one of the biggest pieces of work that I do with clients at the moment. We're also going to show you, or Andrew and Claire are going to show you the, 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 the top line way to ensure you can get a great location. As I say, we're going to give you all of the full details of how to get that whole process afterwards as well. Um, and we're also going to show you the money side of things. We're going to give you an indication of how much you need to spend. And we're going to give you a, a, a sort of quite a clear model then to look at in terms of how much you can make. So here we're talking about the, the, the core menu principle. So the core menu principle that, that I work with and that you need to think about is that a coffee shop should be much, much more than just somewhere that sells coffee. Now, it stands to reason, um, and I'm sure you're aware of that, but it's a it, it's a 
it, it sometimes can be forgotten within a certain type of owner looking to set up a very, very coffee-driven business. What you've got to do is look at targets for each time area, and that breaks down to in the morning for breakfast. You want to be ideally providing a breakfast food item, generally savoury but not necessarily, a juice of some type, and coffee. So those are three key areas that you should be looking to maximize the spend on in the morning rather than just expecting a customer to come in and buy a cup of coffee and leave so the process here is always they come in and they, make, they maybe buy a cup of coffee and your average spend might be two pounds fifty or three pounds for that if we can start getting more food and additional juices that you make on top of that then you're then then what you can do is you can turn your average spend from three pounds into four pounds or four pounds into five pounds. So the key thing is at each stage think, what can I do to balance my menu out so that I can get three sales rather than just one or two rather than one. So when your target here is a f as few single coffee purchases as possible. I'll come into that in a little bit more detail. Mid morning. Okay, so the breakfast market has effectively gone. We're in the morning. Now what we want is basically two critical kind of purchase we want the coffee but we also want them to be buying some sort of a bun or a savory alternative again we want to be looking out over our new coffee shop and seeing as few people sitting with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea on their own as possible so you're at this stage trying to build what i talk about as star product something a sort of a bun offer or something that you could become famous for in the morning so that there's an expectation amongst the customer that they're not just going to you for coffee they're going for coffee and some form of a bun that you do really well and is really unique uh, at lunch we are looking for four individual offers okay now it's rare that you'll get all four but you want to be having something savory from them that could be as simple as a sandwich or a panini and you ideally want them to be buying a bottle of whether it's coca-cola or whether it's some form of purchased drink rather than tap water although you should never preclude them from having tap water so you ideally want those two as your initial sale you also then want to be able to provide them with a cup of tea or coffee and then in the immortal words of Peter Dorsmith, Smith, who runs Caffeine in London, uh, one of the most successful coffee shops in the world, but also a very, very, very good business. Um, he talks about, you know, the offer after lunch of just asking people, would they like something sweet? And, and this, is, this, this is what happens in practice, and it's a very gentle piece of selling. But if you go into Caffeine, or you go into a very well-run uh, business focused coffee shop as well as having exceptional products you will see lots of people who are using all who are buying all four of those it's quite hard to get out of there because his offer is so good without spending the money and therefore as a customer actually you've got something good you've, you've been made happy by the quality of the products that are there but this isn't you've got to be thinking about this in your coffee shop in your menu in your plan what will you have to encourage the average spend to be as close as possible to four items rather than somebody coming in and buying a sandwich and then having just a, um, you know, a glass of tap water? Uh, so you are lost, as I say, if it's savoury plus tap water. In the, or the, sorry, the, it's not that you're lost. The, 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 that comes from a very specific book. You have lost the game. Again, I've had that conversation with, with Peter Tor Smith because he talks about there is a game to be won at each stage of the day in terms of of getting the amount of food that you've made, getting the offer right, getting it all merchandised properly. Um, and you win the game by selling everything that you've got there, by getting your ordering right, but, uh, by, but, but also by having as many customers, as I say, as possible with doing all four of those items. So think about winning and losing the game at each part of the day. And you lose the game at lunch, if you see lots of savoury items plus a tap water, you lose the game in the morning. <coughs> Excuse me. You lose the game in the morning if you have, um, if you just got a cup of coffee and it's home. Uh, in the afternoon, then we have uh, what we're looking for in terms of our targets are coffee and tea and uh, and some form of a cake or a small savoury alternative. This is one of the most difficult times of day to hit properly. But that's what we're looking for here. So core menu principle two then is that you need to have um, you need to have a savory and a sweet part of your menu. So you don't try and build the menu based upon your own palate. 
what you are trying to do is so what I find very often is that when people are building up building up a menu or, or they, they have an existing coffee shop is that it's driven around with the fact that they either have a savory or a sweet palate and what you want to try and do is always be thinking as well about the fact that people have uh, if you've a savory palate as I have you have to build in all the sweet items um, I have a vegetarian client, uh, a client who runs a vegetarian cafe, and it's one of the when when we started working with her, it was one of the most savoury driven offers I have ever seen. There was almost nothing sweet for the customer. It was delicious food. It was very well prepared, but there for those people with a sweet tooth, there was literally nothing for them. So you balance that out, and then you get a much much larger increase in your average spend. So you generally with your palate will be skewed one way or another. When you're sitting looking and creating menus, you want to think, okay, what have I got for the people with a sweet tooth? What have I got for people with a savoury tooth? And again, that's in every step of the, of the day, every phase of the day. So balance is critical, is your core menu principle number two. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to, to Andrew and Claire. It's a slightly clunky way that we do this. And they're going to go through the process of how to choose a good place to open. So let me just fiddle around with this and hopefully we can uh, get it through to them. Um, can, you, can you hear me okay, Andrew and Claire? Hi, John. We can hear you. Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear, John. Thanks. So if I take you on to the next stage uh, of the formula, which is positioning, um, obviously positioning is around the whole brand and what you're, how you're attractive to your customer, how, how you, you get people through your doors. But a more practical description of positioning is your physical location. You know, how do you find a really good place to open? Um, and the number one reason people visit a coffee shop, according to Allegra, who are the leaders in coffee shop research, is about location. Now, every year since they've started, uh, it has been the number one reason cited by people why they want to, why they visit a coffee shop. Now, 28% of people when asked have said that uh, the location is the number one reason. So getting that is absolutely critical. And conversely, the biggest reason for failure of coffee shops is paying too much rent and rates because they focused on getting a great location and they then pay too much. And in fact, the world is littered with examples of where people have overpaid for these things. So Coffee Republic is a great example. Ed's Easy Done last year went for administration. Even Starbucks closed 600 shops at the beginning of the recession. And again, recently, I think it was last week, announced 538 of their Tiavana shops are closing. Now, if you're a Starbucks or a big player, then you know closing all these shops is is a mere blip. If you're an independent, then closing your shop then is is a massive, massive impact. And it is a real dark art. Now, these guys, the big boys, have got whole departments just looking at you know where to open and finding out the the demographics, the macroeconomic data for areas, and you know spreadsheets and thousands of pounds worth of research. And it is a real dark art. Um, but in my Tesco days, I personally was responsible for opening over 100 shops, big shops, small shops, in all parts of the country, and even some internationally. So I became very good at predicting the relative success of each site. And when we started working with coffee shops, uh, and looking at our own coffee shops, in fact, uh, opening, um, we came up out this 73... This is where the 73-point formula came from, in truth. Um because the number one question we get asked now when we're consulting with clients is, right, how do I find a good site? And after they say, how do I find a good site? They say, well, you know, I can't find a good site because they're all gone. How do I find them? And then the next the next statement is, well, I can't get the rent and rates to, to get anywhere close to 10% of sales. So, you know, it is, it is a really difficult thing for you to get right, but such an important thing to get right at the beginning. So what we do, we, we take people through the checklist, but basically we look at it, look at it in this aspect. So if you look at rent and rates uh, on the left-hand side and then correlate that with how good a site is, amazing, good, okay, or poor, you know, if you, if you map a typical big high street site, that would be an amazing site at high rent. Same with a shopping centre, you know, a really good high footfall site with a high rent. On a secondary high street or in a lesser smaller town then your rent and rates is going to be less but you know the number of footfall past the door is going to be less as well 
And then if you move to a side street, which a lot of us look at, you can see that the rent rates are a lot less, but there's a hell of a lot less people walking past the front door. And then eventually then, you know, if you go to the ultimate industrial unit, then it's much cheaper, but it's not the natural location for a coffee shop. The other fact to consider, of course, is that how much you need to spend to fill your coffee shop. So if you pay top dollar and you've got a highly visible site, then you don't, you know, an amazing site, you don't need to spend an awful lot of money on marketing because in truth, people will be walking through you past your door and you'll get enough people in anyway. If you are slightly off piste, then you will need to consider spending some money on marketing. And what we suggest is you look at these two things in conjunction. You just don't look at them in isolation. You know, they should be considered as one. The premium price you pay for a location should be considered as a marketing cost. And But the trick is to get the marketing cost and the rent and rates at a point where the total costs are less uh, and keep you... Um, so you'll generate enough sales and enough people through the door in a in a not as good a site, you know, a, a perceived not as good a site, I'm saying, uh, but then by clever marketing, and when I talk about marketing, I talk about everything from PR to prices to signage to offers to deals um, to get people in your business. So if you can, the, the trick is really is, is to look at the two things together um, and then look for the sweet spot where the two things overlap. And that's what our 73 point checklist will help you identify. So it clears over to you now, Claire, about the, uh, the actual 73 point checklist on its, uh, in its, in itself. Hang on. Here we go. Claire. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, as Andrew's already said, uh, I'm just going to uh, touch on a few points included in that checklist. And at the end of the webinar, you can download it in full. People ask us things like, how big a unit? What's the size of the ideal unit? Well, it's not necessarily the size, it's the number of seats you can get in. If you can only get 10 seats in, it just won't cut it and you won't make any money. You need at least 40 and hopefully a lot more. Buy yourself a clicker and count the number of your ideal customers that's walking past the front door. And remember, it's not just the number, it's their intention. Are they busy people? Are they rushing somewhere? Or will they have time to stop and spend time with you? Windows are really, really important. The more, the better. But the more windows you have usually means higher rates due to the longer frontage. But you need windows for people to see in and see what you do so that they will come in. Outside seating is important, but you have to factor in permission can you get permission for outside seating? And how much will it cost to rent the space? And But think of the extra seats that you can have. The more outside seating you get will all add up to the number of covers that you've got. Parking is so important, but we don't mean just parking outside your unit. Think of public car parks. Are they free? Are they expensive? Do that people walk past your door to get to the car park and vice versa? Competition can be really good. If a chain is there, it must be a good good place because people are already coming there. And as Andrew has already said, the chains do their homework and they've worked out that it is a good location. In the same way, no competition being there is a bad thing because competition will come. As soon as you open the door, somebody will open up next door to you. So build this into your business model. Build it into your uniqueness and your attractiveness. So people will come to you over them. How much will it cost to convert the unit? You've got to factor in how old it is, what the floors, the ceiling, the walls are like. For example, we've looked at shells that have cost would cost something like 100k just to get ready. So factor all this into your business plan and be very aware of the ready to move in units that have had failed businesses before. Everyone thinks that their business is good and it's going to work. But if there's been three coffee shops in that unit already that have all opened up and failed, ask yourself why. You also have to milk your assets. So if you can open seven days a week, you'll take more money. If you open, for example, on a, in a business district that everything shuts down on the weekends, you will only be able to open five days. So therefore not take as much money. So factor that in. 
everything looks better in the sunshine. Outside seating works much better and you'll get more people walking past your door because people like the sunny side of the road. Having no barriers to coming into your coffee shop, steps will deter everybody, not just wheelchairs and prams. And look at the age of the building. An older building will be less cost efficient to run, for example, with electricity. And you will also have to factor in the maintenance and protection orders and leases. Can you build a relationship with the landlord? Are they the decision maker or just part of a big corporate where the contact may change? And if you don't ask in this world, you don't get. Ask them, can you have a rent free period? Or will they help with the costs of the conversion? How big and visible is the outside signage? Now McDonald's do this perfectly. They have those huge M's that everyone can see for miles around. I don't expect you to do that, but your signage must be clear and big and visible. People must see from across the road or down the road, see exactly what you do and so they can come and visit you. Outside seating work in the rain works much better if you've got a canopy. Is there one there already? Or can, have you got a permission to add one? Also, look at the opportunities of other local businesses that are around you to work with, for example, office complex, so that you can do a joint venture with them. And throughout the whole process of choosing your location, you must factor in your why. For example, you wouldn't open a vegan cafe in the middle of a meat market. Your ideal customer must be outside your door. And look at the shape of the building. Which what would work best for you? Long and thin buildings are not easy to get right and you have less frontage and windows. Also the number of floors. Everything works better on the ground floor. Nobody likes going upstairs. Even if you've got huge signage that says more seating upstairs or anything like that, it doesn't work. Most people prefer the ground floor. And in fact, the upstairs only get 20% of the takings of the ground floor anyway. Make sure there's enough power to the unit. You'll need three phrase. Old domestic units won't have enough power. And also look at the other services such as water, gas and drainage. We can speak from experience on one of our shops that a salad flow pump does not work. So avoid those at all costs. And ventilation. Now in your coffee shop, you'll have lots of things that will make heat. Your customers, your, your staff, your dishwasher, your ovens, all generate heat. So you don't want your coffee shop to be either over hot or freezing cold in the winter. And a lot of coffee shops, if you look around, they will have steamed up windows because they haven't got their ventilation right. And nobody wants to walk in to a coffee shop that you can't see through the windows. These are just a taster of what is included in the 73 point checklist. So download it at the end. Over to you, John. So, yes, got it. Thanks. Andrew, Claire, thank you very much. Uh, again, as I say, fascinating. And, and we will give you the full details at the end of how to get that full that full process. So one of the questions that we get asked most, we've, we've done a lot of research, research recently, one of the, the questions we get asked most is how much should I make? So let's let's take a look, let's try and break the whole thing down. So if we have £100,000 of sales, about £2,000 a week, and you would hope to be doing a lot more than that, you will be expecting to break this down uh, in the following fashion. You would expect that your food and beverage cost, i.e. the hard cost of the coffee beans and the buns and so on that you're producing, should cost you in and around 30% or £30,000 from that 100000 which then leaves you with £70,000 worth of gross profit, is what we call that. We then would be expecting, under that model, approximately a £30,000 wage cost for the year. That gives us then £40,000 as a contribution to overhead. Out of that £40,000, we've got to pay our rent, our rates, and about £10,000 worth of general overhead, which will leave us with about £15,000 of net profit, or about 15% to the bottom line. If that was a million pounds worth of turnover, and we we would all know a number of sites that are doing a million pounds worth or, or thereabouts of turnover, the same figures will apply. You'd have about £300,000 worth of food and beverage cost. You'd have about a £300,000 wage cost. You might have... Um, 
a, a 30,000, um, uh, sorry, you, you would have about £100,000 worth of a wage bill, a rent bill potentially, about 5,000, 50,000 would go on rates, and then about another 100,000 of general overhead. So out of a million pounds of turnover you would be expecting to produce as a minimum now, because at that level of turnover, a few more things would be more efficient. You'd be expecting to produce a minimum of £150,000 of the net profit. But those are the core rules. So the golden rules are, your rent should be somewhere in the region of about 10% of your sales. And you need to ignore that rule at your peril. If you are in London at the moment and you can charge a premium, you will have almost no option but to be more than 10% of your rent because it's so expensive in London at the moment. But there you should be able to try and pull the extra sales through the extra profit through by being able to charge a bit more but London's a difficult market at the moment. Your prime cost is a maximum of 60%. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the prime cost is your wage cost and your food and beverage cost. And that can split up in a number of different ways. That could be 30% cost of sales and 30% wage cost. It could be 25% cost of sales and 35% wage cost. Now in a model like that, that would be for a business that is making a lot more of the food on site. So they will make more profit on the food that is made, but they will have to put more wages to produce that. Or it could be the other way around. You might have a 35% cost of sales and a 25% wage cost. And obviously in a business like that, you would have less staff making the food. Therefore, the cost comes down, but you're making less money because you're buying it in and some margin has to go to it through to whoever has, has, has helped you make it. So your job on a day-to-day -day basis in your business is managing those variables. Your variables are increasing the sales and you do that through increasing customers through increasing average spend which i talked about in some of the menu design and through in through increasing the frequency of the visit secondly your your second variable to manage is driving down the wage cost in percentage terms i.e improving efficiency that's not just paying people less it means running a solid efficient business where people are paid well but they are working very very well operationally that you've got you're getting the most out of them so that your wage cost in percentage terms is as low as possible and finally you're driving down the food and beverage costs you're con constantly reworking your menu to be as profitable as possible you're constantly negotiating and working with suppliers and the people in your kitchens to ensure that you uh, are, are buying as good as well as you possibly can and you are also being as brave as you possibly can with the prices because if you're as brave as possible with the prices it makes it much easier to manage all three of those so managing the variables on a day-to-day -day basis is effectively those three things that's what your job becomes on this business so how much will it cost to set up a business. Well, th this is a very difficult one. And again, Andrew and I, and Claire and I have, have debated this many times. We've, we've debated it with many clients. It varies enormously, I have to say. The annoying answer is it's anywhere between 35 grand and about 250,000, or indeed 600,000 pounds is what I know somebody spent recently uh, on a coffee shop in London. So it can be as broad as that. Your arm, the even more annoying answer is how long is a piece of string? So with that out of the way, some key rules are, be very cautious um, think, will this thing that I'm expecting to spend money on actively improve the customer experience? So I have come in um, to a couple of businesses in the last year after they've already opened and they've done some really, really expensive, beautiful things tiled certain areas that the customer will never see that really could have been done infinitely more cheaply. So people can spend a lot of money on something, on things in their business that actively don't improve the customer experience. Now this is a line that I've got through from my friend who sold a business, a restaurant business for 51 million. And, and, and that was the line that he said, this is what people always do when they start up. They keep spending money on things that don't improve the customer experience. So do not skimp on professional surveys to begin with. And what I mean by that is you don't really know what might be going on in, in that building and down in the, in, the, in the drains or structurally. And these are the things that can hold you up tremendously in the initial stages. They can also cost you a fortune to get fixed. So make sure that you spend that little bit of extra money to ensure that you don't end up with a 10 or 20 or 30,000 pound additional bill that could perhaps scupper the whole business before you ever get started. Um, and 
if you can, and you know, I, I'm the first to admit that I haven't always done this, add an extra 30% on as a contingency and working capital for things will go wrong. So what do I mean by that? If we assume that depending on where you are, you maybe might be spending £100,000 to put together your coffee shop. Ideally, you want another £30,000 on top of that to try and cover the things that will go wrong and to cover perhaps what might go wrong in the first few weeks or you might you know, be less busy than you'd expected or you might open at the wrong time of the year or all of those various things. So try and think of it in that way. So please, please, please remember now that we've got here that this is sort of not just theory. These principles were gained through decades of work and mistakes in our own business. All we've had time to do here is show you some of the top line out of the, out of the top seven steps in terms of what we have. These are the, exactly the same principles that we use with our clients. So what is this all about here? Well, what we're talking about here is a much broader way to provide you with a framework, a crystal clear roadmap to help you open your cafe or coffee shop. It's about helping you not make the expensive mistakes and go over budget when you open. It's about giving you the very best chance available to open a successful business. It's also about providing you with confidence to know that you're making the right decisions. So I'm not sure why you showed up today. It may just be because you're ready to open but just needed some extra pointers. It may be because you're totally bewildered with the mechanics of opening a coffee shop and need some help. Or perhaps you're still in the early planning stages and don't know what you don't know yet. Uh, but I do hope that you really get this one thing. We, myself, Claire and Andrew, really have found the secret of opening successful coffee shops. And going on this bumpy journey and discovering these secrets utterly changed our lives and those of our clients. It's something that you can do. There is a process that you can that you can work through. There is a step-by-step -step formula. As I say, we've only touched on some of the aspects. And you can, in a very short period of time, have the full tools to help you do the same. So the obvious question is, how do I apply all of this information to my new coffee shop? Uh, well, you've got a choice. You can do it the slow way using trial and error and some of what we've ta taught you today. Or you can do it quickly using our full seven-step process. I'm a very big believer in this, in, in, this, in this quote from Albert Einstein, that everything in life should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. Running a coffee shop is not simple. Uh, what we have been working away at and what we're working away on at the moment is a whole process to give you exactly what you need to open a great coffee shop, but without any of the superfluous information. So the coffee shop startup bootcamp, which is what we're talking about here, is designed to give you that solution. It's designed to give you every little thing that you need to set up a successful and profitable coffee shop. It's absolutely the fastest way to get from your idea to a fully functional and profitable business. It helps you to do this. It helps you to find this path in this treacherous, you know, in this treacherous world and not this, because this is how most people in many cases set up a coffee shop they just dive off the cliff they just jump in they jump in with enthusiasm and passion and adrenaline and and, and there's so much to be admired for that because I've done it myself but that's how you make the mistakes so what exactly is it that we're talking about well it's a 13 module live event that we're running on the 20th the 21st and the 20th sorry I've got the dates wrong the 20th the 21st and the 22nd of September it's delivered by all three of us at Union Coffee in London Union Coffee in London they've got these wonderful new training rooms uh, and it's state of the art but also they are some of the biggest operators in the industry we will provide you then with a full preparation pack in advance of the event and full one-to-one -one follow up afterwards. It is the total solution that we've never done before to helping you set up a profitable coffee shop. Nothing is left out. You get full online resources as well after the event as well as all of the follow up. Before you come to the boot camp, we will give you a full box of stuff that lands on your doorstep. This is all of this preparation work and a few other tricks of the trade to get you as far along the road as possible before we actually meet. The aim is to maximize the value that you receive over the three days. Day one is uh, module one. We start with getting clear and it's not that sort of, what is that in, in Scientology? Is that going clear so this is about getting clear in your business it's nothing to do with Scientology it's about getting a clear, crystal clear idea of what your business will be for you to get clear in your head for us so that we can help you and for all of your fellow attendees so that they can also be part of a broader group to help you and finally for potential investors which is a very big piece that that, that Andrew will be will be working on
the second module on day one is where we go into the location piece, this really big one that we say that you've got to get right. And you will learn exactly what you need to know to evaluate a potential site. Uh, and we will review your potential options if you've already identified a location. Module three is where we go deep into the menu. We go much deeper into terms of what we've uh, what I've done today and we'll show you exactly what you can deliver and should deliver. You'll learn how to break down every part of the day for maximum profit. We'll show you how to create star products which are the key way to help you create a highly profitable business and build repeat customers and give you a big leg up from what the chains do. So you'll leave obsessed with building average spend and value to the customer because the two are not exclusive. In fact, the two go hand in hand. Module four is where we go through the costings and the margins. We give you very simple models to show you how just a few pence of better gross profit can mean thousands every year. We show you all the tools you need to consistently hit your gross profit targets. And you'll leave with this 17 step gross profit process to ensure that everyone in the business stays on target. We'll break down actual menus and turn you into a margin analyzing machine, which means you become very frustrating person to be around when you're in a restaurant or you're in a coffee shop because you're constantly having these conversations with your partner or friends about what they should or shouldn't be doing. Module five is where we go through the layout. Now we're using Union for a reason, not just how they got the amazing state-of-the-art roasting facilities. They've got very large space, they've lots of coffee machines, and they've enough space for us to effectively lay out a coffee shop and show you what should be where. We'll show you exactly how to create a great experience for your customers and for your staff. Because if you skimp too much on the positioning of the equipment and how it all works together in terms of the space for the staff, um, you, you, you don't have an efficient business, which then will obviously starts to hit back in terms of what you can provide for the customer. So you'll learn the tricks and details that will save you thousands in the future and potentially tens of thousands over the life of your business. Because as I say, nearly everybody makes layout mistakes to begin with that cost them sales uh, that mean that they have they don't run an efficient business, which means that their wage cost is too high. So you can you have the potential to save a fortune with this module alone, even though it may not sound particularly interesting. Uh, day two, we start with module six, which is about the money. It's the best ways to raise money. Big piece that Andrew's been doing and been speaking on um, uh, all over the world in terms of understanding how to raise money for these kinds of businesses. We show you the best ways to structure your new business. We show you how to set up and manage a profit and loss structure, and we show you how to create a dashboard of the key metrics so that you don't go off track you don't have a chance to go off track and perhaps be distracted by too many other things and then realize that your you, your business isn't profitable enough uh, module seven is where we go into the whole people process now as I explained earlier on this is huge uh, it's how to create great how to recruit great people how to induct them properly into your vision and ethos and then how to keep them we also show you how to manage them so that you achieve the target of this magic three doing the work of four target, which drives down your wage costs and then increases the amount that you can pay them. So the people part of it is is enormous in terms of running the business that is less stressful for you uh, because you get good people in. But there's a lot to be saved here in terms of wage costs while still paying people well. But we'll break that all down for you in this module. Module 8 is equipment. This is a minefield to an extent because you can very easily spend far, far too much on the wrong things. So what do you really need? What is worth spending on and what can you save with? How certain pieces of equipment can save you money in many other areas. Module 9 is where we go into suppliers, how you choose between various types of suppliers that you need, how to build long-term relationships that can help save the day when inevitably you mess up a bit or you make a mistake and you need to be leaning on the supplier, and when to go local and how to get maximum value for this for you and your suppliers, how to work with local suppliers so that you, you, you work together as a team and drive sales up for both of you. And I've done this in a lot of my own businesses. And also how to negotiate for the best prices without kind of being sleazy and an aggressive, you know, uh, negotiator, but also making sure that you get you are paying as a fair price but as low as possible for what you're buying and so you can drive your own profitability. Module 10 is where we go into marketing. It's how, it's the, we give you the strategy for how to hit the ground running, how to get going as quickly and as effectively as possible so that you get into profit as quickly as possible and not spend several months losing money before you can get into profit. And we have a whole strategy for that. Um, 
We show you how to build average sales. We show you how to build uh, repeat customers. And we show you how to use social media, not just to build your own business, but build the long-term brand value. Because if you build your business well, and you manage to sell it then on through to somebody else with a very strong social media presence, it allows them then to build that business further, maybe into new sites. And that's where having social media, plus a lot of other little tricks that we'll talk to you about, you know, email lists and things like that. That's how you really drive the value. Day three, we start off with uh, module 11 being technology. EPOS systems, accounting software, the simple spreadsheets that you need. What we're trying to do is give you everything you need to make it easier to run the business and as inexpensively as possible. Because you can spend, you could spend 15 to 20 thousand pounds, believe it or not, on the EPOS system for one shop uh, or quite radically less. So there are lots of different options here, uh, lots of different ways to go, but ultimately what we're trying to show you is what you need, how much you need to spend, and what kind of information you need then off the back of that. Module 12 is coffee. Uh, you get a full roastery tour at Union's state-of-the-art facilities we talked about, but perhaps of at least as much information or use is all the details from their experts on what you really need and don't need. Uh, how to create a coffee menu that sells. This is vital because we're coming back to the pure profitability aspect of it again. Great coffee, but through a menu that actually increases the spend. Module 13 is all about the systems and processes. This is all about pulling it together, pulling on this great menu, these great people, so that they can deliver consistency. You want to be able to build this business so that you have a functioning business even when you're not there. We want to ensure this consistency that I've talked about. This reason why people go to the chains is for consistency. Now, we might all think that the chains aren't particularly consistent, but the general public, that's one of the key reasons that they would list in terms of why they say they go. What you're trying to do is beat them at their own game in terms of the consistency, but with a vastly superior product. And that's what we're going to show you in that module. So finally, then, at the end of day three, we'll do hot seats. We'll break down your actual businesses and plans from you and your fellow attendees. We'll actually go through the businesses and, and, and the case studies that exist within the room. So you are probably thinking, how much will this all cost me? Well, full consulting, consulting for a new start from me starts at £12,000 because there's so much work that has to go into, um, in, in, into helping a new business start. Uh, and I'm booked up for the next six months anyway. I know Andrew and Claire are pretty much booked up too. Uh, and this information that we've produced here costs hundreds of cost us hundreds of thousands of pounds to learn the hard way over the last 25 years. And these exact processes uh, that we're going to teach you made one client of mine over 20 million pounds when he sold the business. And it's the same systems and processes that I have used to help open 27 new coffee shops from scratch, all of which are profitable. So it's the same. The, we're not leaving anything out. This is exactly how Andrew and Claire run their own businesses, how we would do consulting through with you if you were if it was one on one consulting. And it's also proven out there in the in the field, as it were, in the sort of harsh economic reality. But it'll cost you a tiny fraction of those figures. You can get started today for two thousand pounds plus VAT or two and a half thousand pounds plus VAT if you want to bring a partner. So you can bring somebody along, you know, who is involved with your business potentially for an extra 500 pounds. You will immediately then, once you sign up, receive the full pre-work book to get you started. Then we'll meet for the three full days at Union, where you'll not only learn all the skills, but be able to ask any questions you want. And it's a very selective group so that we can provide you with, with, with the full value. So we are not bringing in dozens and dozens of people. We have a very small cap in terms of the numbers so that you get your questions answered. You will also get much more. You'll have a month of full access to us and your fellow attendees via a private group to continue asking questions, building out your plan. And we will personally, one of us will personally review your plan by phone. We'll all go through all of the plans, but one of us will go through it by phone with you during this month to give you pointers and tweaks and adjustments to that to help with the ongoing direction. So to sum up, if you want to set up a profitable coffee shop without wasting time and money, there is no better system. This is exactly what we needed when we started. It would have saved us hundreds and thousands of pounds and years of time. It would have saved me from losing my whole sandwich business too. You get all the modules in digital and printed format too, so you don't have to be held to a schedule. You don't have to be all finished within that month or finished or ready to go. It doesn't matter where you are in the business now. You will have access to all of this material until you are ready. And you get a full month, as we say, of ongoing support. So right now, 
click the link below or which should have appeared on this page uh, or go to this page www.coffeeshopbootcamp.com forward slash choose and there you will be able to see the two different options you click the button that says one attendee or two attendees and you'll see this page there you see click on one attendee or two attendee that takes you through to this enter your name details and click on this on this billing method where they've I've got the blue arrow and then up will pop this little box where you can enter your credit or debit card details now this what will this will then go through to just to give you a little bit of um of context will be the name that will appear on your credit card statement or, or or bank statement will be Andrew and Claire's business which is Cafe Success Hub so that's that's who this is going through and as I say Andrew and Claire uh, have been doing this for many years and, and and therefore you can completely trust what's going on here and it's using Stripe is the payment provider so this little box will pop up and then you fill in your details and you'll get immediate access to the online materials so and I say, within a week, of course, your boot camp box will also arrive with lots of goodies and the tricks of the trade to help you get started. So this really is about, as I say, trying to provide you with these, this whole overall business plan to help you set up a profitable business. And we would love to have you along. We very much look forward to meeting you. So click the link below and... Um, uh, go through the process you'll get signed up you'll get immediate access through to the online information you'll get the, the details by post uh, and we will then get you more information before it happens uh, but we would very much like to have you there um, and oh uh, so I'm running out of time here but what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you through an, an email through with the details for, for Andrew and Claire's process and the slides after this um, but thank you very much for your time. I hope this was of benefit, whether we see you or not. I hope it gives you a little bit more of an insight into what you need to be working on and how to try, how to try and run a, a profitable business. But I'd very much like to have you along uh, for those three days to really try and, and, and accurately um, build your business for you or help you to build your business. So thank you very much for your time and uh, I look forward to seeing you.